Around 5.30 p.m. on Sunday, Beverly walked through the front door, threw her purse and keys on the nightstand, and headed down the hallway to the master bedroom. I don't know for sure if she saw me sitting in the office, but it didn't matter. Over the past few years, I have become almost invisible to her. I walked over and took her set of keys. I took the spare keys to my Toyota from her and then opened her Porsche. I took out her cell phone and wallet. I took out all the cash and credit cards from my wallet and put all the loot in my pocket. Just to be safe, I took her driver's license. Then I returned to my place in the office. Fifteen minutes later, Bev returned to the hall, beautifully dressed. Seeing me, when she threw the strap of her purse over her shoulder and grabbed the keys, she said, I'm going to meet some girls from work. Do not wait for me. No, you won't go out with girls from work, I objected. Jack, you should already know that you don't control me. I will do whatever I please. I didn't say you couldn't date girls from work. I said you are not going to date girls from work. You're going to go and fuck your boyfriend, so don't lie to me anymore. Beverly stood silently for a few seconds. Then she boldly entered the office and stood opposite me, presenting her ultimatum. Okay, Jack, so you know. I'd rather do this differently, but we might as well end it now. Jack, you have two options. You can save what's left of this marriage by accepting some freedom from me, or you can choose to have me divorce you and cut you out of my life. What will you choose? Hmm. I choose. Door number three, I answered with a grin. Don't be a child. There is no door number three. Either accept the fact that I now have a lover, a real man for a change, or prepare for the consequences. And I do mean your suffering. I stood up, walked over to Bev, grabbed her by the shoulders and pushed her against the wall. I took the engagement ring and wedding rings off her left hand. With my lips inches from her face and a dead look in my eyes, I whispered furiously to her. Oh, here's door number three. Look, it's right over there. This is my front door. And when you walk out of it, it will be the last time. You leave with the clothes on your back and never set foot in the door again. You won't get another cent of my money. Eventually, you will lose your husband, your daughter, your house, your money, your car, and your job. You live in a fantasy world, Jack, she muttered nervously. My lawyer will tear you to pieces. Tomorrow I will send the divorce papers to your work. If you hurt me, you will suffer much more than me. I lifted her shoulders off the wall and Frog dragged her toward the front door as she stumbled in her high heels. She screamed incoherently as I pushed her out the door. Bev could barely keep her balance, and her composure had completely disappeared. In our entire marriage, I never raised my hand to her, and she didn't know how to react. Standing in the front yard, she began to come to her senses, and at that moment I closed the door and locked the lock, which I had already replaced this afternoon. As Bev left, I made the first of two calls. I dialed my 19-year-old daughter's number in college. Honey, this is Dad. The relationship with your mother has finally reached its climax. She'll probably be living with her boyfriend, and I wanted to talk to you first. I want you to know that I have my last conversation with your mother on tape, along with hours and hours of previous arguments. They are available for you to listen to, so please remember that you have access to the truth when she tries to twist things around and blame me, and she will try to do it. Honey, the truth is that your mother is an adulteress. I don't know how many times she's been with other men, but this time she found someone she's willing to leave our family for. As I'll explain to you shortly, this probably means that her boyfriend is a pretty dangerous person, so be very careful in your relationship with your mother. Next, I asked Patty if she could come home for the weekend so we could talk and she could listen to the tapes if she wanted. Patty agreed to come home on Friday. My next call was to Martha, our neighbor at the end of the block. Martha was a widow and about 30 years old. Martha, this is Jack. If the offer is still valid, I would like to take advantage of it. Can you come over in an hour or so? I hate long stories of troubled marriages, so I'll keep this story pretty short. Bev and I met and married in our early 20s and had a daughter, Patty. Things were fine for a couple of years, but the feelings seemed to pass rather quickly for Bev. As events unfolded, she became more and more grumpy. 
She turned into a troublemaker, a manipulator, and a taskmaster. I tried my best to keep my mouth shut and make her feel better, but it seemed like the more I tried, the worse it got. Indeed, I now believe that I contributed to my own suffering by trying to appease Bev all these years. I now regret that I didn't do things differently and take control of her and the situation from the beginning. So now, in our forties, everything has gone completely awry. When I suspected Bev and did some research, I found out about her boyfriend pretty quickly, and the results were startling. She contacted an ex-con with a reputation for raping women. I don't think Bev knew this initially, but her lover had at least two other women on the hook when Bev showed up. This guy's name is Sylvester, and he is, of course, known as Sly. I was amazed when I found out about it, but in a way, it also made sense to me. So when I found out that our marriage was indeed over, I was overcome with great relief and started planning. I've read stories where the offended husband takes half the money, not me. I took every damn penny I could get my hands on, including all the cash I could find in the house. I changed the locks, of course, and had plans to piss Bev off as much as possible. You see, my marriage had taught me a lot about how she reacted, and I planned to use her temper against her. She was a dangerous woman in many ways, but this time she would be dangerous to herself, too. In fact, my planning began long before I knew about her lover, and the end came. For several years, I recorded us whenever we had an argument. She thought the device I always carried with me was a simple MP3 player, but in reality I was building a library of her antics to document. I knew that no one would believe my stories unless I had proof, since she only abused me this way when we were alone. Around other people, including our daughter, she was sweet as pie. I wanted to be able to tell everyone about it, including all my friends and family. The Monday after our Sunday fight, I threw a party in the company break room. There was a large banner hanging overhead that read, Happy Divorce. I had my cake and ice cream ready and was anxiously awaiting the arrival of the process server. I was lucky that it was a chubby girl doing the dirty work. Many photographs were taken as my colleagues and I celebrated the delivery of our divorce papers. I took a photo while accepting the papers and kissing the server girl on the cheek. She was wearing a festive pointed hat at the time. In another photo, I put a fork of cake in her mouth, and we both smiled. When the party ended, I emailed the photos to Bev. Along with photos from the party, I sent a couple photos of myself and Martha, my roommate, in my bed, with the sheets pulled up to our necks and big smiles on our faces. I hoped Bev would notice her wedding rings on Martha's left hand, resting on my chest. An hour later, I received an angry call. You son of a bitch! My lawyer will eat you for lunch after these photos. What a stupid ass you are. Hardly, Bev. There is nothing obscene or compromising in these images. No nudity. Just two neighbors decided to play pranks. Just funny pictures, that's all. We'll look at this later. Jack, I'll stop by the house this evening to pick up some of my things. I think it would be better if you weren't there. If I'm not there, you won't be able to enter. All locks have been replaced. If you need anything, you should be there well before 6.45. Martha and I have a date at 7 p.m., and I'm pretty damn sure I don't want to be late. Last night, I had the best sex I've ever had, and tonight will be even better. I then hung up and didn't answer when she called back five times. Although I haven't answered all her calls since then, I have listened to all the messages, unlike other guys I've read about in similar circumstances. There was a good chance that Bev would say something incriminating or accidentally give away a secret when she called in anger. In fact, she did give herself away several times in the coming weeks. At 4.30 that day, I drove to the parking lot at Bev's work. I wanted to get there before people started going home. I made sure there were no security cameras in the parking lot, and what I had to do would take less than a minute. I pulled up next to Bev's car and walked around her, using wire cutters to cut off the valve stems on all of her tires. Oh yeah, she'll definitely be angry. Plus, she'll never fix them in time to get home before 6.45. But it was about 6.35 when she showed up. Apparently, she had gone for a ride with someone, so I knew she was desperate to get into the house. After all, I had seen receipts for clothes she bought that I knew she didn't bring home. So she must have had a lot of clothes in her lover's house, 
she must want something else. I slipped out the back door and hurried to Martha's house, leaving Bev banging on the front door and screaming. When I returned that evening, my front door window was broken and there was blood all around it. After reviewing the security camera footage from the front porch, I called the police. The video showed Bev hitting the window with a tire iron, apparently taken from her friend's car. You could clearly hear her threatening to kill me as she broke the glass and climbed inside. Unfortunately for her, the lock I installed was one of those that requires a key on both sides to open. When she pulled her hand back, she cut her forearm quite badly, prompting another round of screams and threats from her. I immediately reported the incident to the police, and one of the officers kindly walked me through the process of filing a protection claim. The next morning, Bev was served with papers prohibiting her from coming within 500 feet of me or our home. To say she was angry would be putting it mildly. What the hell are you doing, asshole? Thus began her next phone call. She was furious and threatened me again. I recorded the entire conversation. A few hours later, having calmed down a little, she called again. She said she would send her friend Lindsay to pick up some of her things that evening. What is she so desperate to get from the house? I thought. So I agreed to see Lindsay at 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday. I left work a little early to set up a video camera in my bedroom with a monitor in my office. Lindsay arrived on time and I was very cordial. I sat on the bed while she put some clothes into two black plastic trash bags. Lindsay looked at me nervously and then asked if I would get her some water from the kitchen. I smiled and left. As soon as I looked at the monitor, I saw Lindsay pull a shoebox out of her closet and into a bag next to her. Then she went back to choosing clothes. I quickly grabbed a glass of water from the kitchen and returned to the bedroom. I think that's enough, she said. Could you take this bag and I'll take that one? Oh, this one looks heavier, Lindsay. Let me take it. Uh, no, I'm fine. Just take another one, okay? Is there anything in this package that I should know about, Lindsay? I asked as she began to fidget and drag her package towards the door. I took her wrist and opened the package. These are just clothes and things that Bev needs, she said anxiously. You're a bad liar, Lynn. What's in this box that I smell here? Care to tell me about it? I pulled out a shoe box and opened it. The box was filled with stacks of $50 and $100 bills, all of them looking tattered. Lindsay, you're trying to rob me. I stood up and pulled her hand behind her back, leading her to the door and down the corridor. Jack, this is Bev's money. She sent me here to pick him up. I'm not stealing anything. Well, you came to my house to buy clothes, and I found you coming out with a box of money. I call it stealing. I don't see Beverly's name on this box. You're a thief, Lindsay. I'm going to call the police. Right now. Prepare to be arrested for robbery. No, Jack. Do not do that. I can't go to jail. I have children and a husband, for God's sake. I sat Lindsay down on the couch and looked her straight in the face. Lindsay, you will never be welcome in this house again. I thought you were my friend, but now I know that you are a thief. She kept begging me and started crying. If you want to atone for your guilt, you have one chance. You will leave this house and tell Bev that I caught you stealing. Then you will report to me everything you hear or see especially anything related to our divorce or her relationship with Sly. You won't tell her anything about our agreement. Bev made a really bad decision getting involved with this loser, and you will ultimately help her leave him if you cooperate with me. And Lindsay, I have the entire episode on video and I can call the police and file a report against you at any time. Lindsay reluctantly agreed to be my mole. As soon as she left, I took the box of money and walked to Martha's house at the end of the block. She agreed to hide it for me until I could safely hide it somewhere where Bev could never find it. I knew where the money most likely came from. Bev's Aunt Mabel was a notorious miser, and when she died a few months ago, Bev was her only heir. I knew that her aunt had left her a small hut in the countryside, but there was never any mention of money. Apparently, when Bev inspected the cabin after the will was read, she discovered her aunt's money stashed there. When my slut wife called and screamed, I recorded the conversation but was careful what I said. This money is mine, Jack. I want my damn money. 
Bev, I don't know what you're talking about. I caught Lindsay trying to steal money from my nightstand. This is my money. You know damn well what I'm talking about. The money is in a shoebox and it's mine. This is from Aunt Mabel. I inherited them. Well, maybe Lindsay did find some money in a shoebox. But if she did, she must have taken them with her and kept them for herself. I do not have them. Maybe Lindsay stole from you. And if you had any money here that I didn't know about, you didn't report it on your taxes last year. I know this because I have read and signed tax returns. You can call the police to investigate, and then we'll tell the IRS about this money and let them decide what to do about your tax evasion. She hung up. There had to be some kind of revenge. I knew it. I pushed Bev's buttons too hard for her to be gone. She couldn't afford to be caught outside her house because of the restraining order. Since I started by ruining her car, I thought she might try to get revenge on me through my car. So I had a camera mounted on the dashboard, but it wasn't enough. I wanted to get good shots of her doing her thing if she decided to go that route. So when I parked in front of the garage on Wednesday morning, I set up a camera outside the house, hidden from prying eyes. This camera transmitted video that I could watch from my desk. An hour before lunch, I watched on my laptop as Bev parked her car behind mine, got out, and started hitting my car with a hammer. She broke all the windows and dented every wing. I winced a little when the camera caught her smashing the windshield and screaming, That's how I'm going to hit you over the head! I dialed 911 and there was a police car waiting for her as she pulled out of the driveway. When I showed them the video and my wrecked Toyota, they handcuffed Bev and took her to jail. It was clear that she had caused enough harm to qualify as a criminal offense. The resisting arrest charge was gravy. She turned to look at me with pleading eyes as she was led away. But I just stared at her silently. Bev's divorce lawyer called me on Wednesday to tell me there would be a hearing in court regarding access to the money I had withdrawn from our joint accounts. It was scheduled for Thursday at 10 a.m. I was in the courtroom at 9.50, wondering if Bev had posted bail. She arrived with her lawyer just in time, with a smug look on her face. Bev's lawyer addressed the judge. Your Honor, my client was cut off from the bank accounts she shared with her husband. He illegally took all the money after she filed for divorce. At the moment, we are asking the court to split it 50-50. Mr. Reynolds, do you want to say something? Yes, Your Honor. My unfaithful wife has plenty of her own money, which she has been withdrawing from our joint accounts for months. The money I withdrew was reasonable compensation since I am responsible for paying rent and bills. She gave up on our marriage and moved in with the man she's cheating on me with. Bev stood up. It's a lie. He took all the money from our savings and checks. He didn't leave me a dime. I have nothing. Lawyer Bev took her hand and sat her back down. They had a small conference while I handed over the documents to the judge. Your Honor, these are bank statements for last year. You'll notice that amounts up to a few months ago, including Bev's salary, are highlighted in yellow. In addition, there are periodic bonuses highlighted in orange. Then, about six months ago, her checks stopped depositing into the joint account, and her bonuses also disappeared. I have a recording of my conversation with her HR if you want to hear it, which confirms that her direct deposit was changed to her personal account. The total amount transferred from our joint account is in the thousands of dollars, Your Honor. It is clear that my unfaithful wife has plenty of wealth, and it is all stolen from our marriage. The judge looked at the bank statements and then looked over his glasses at Beverly. Do you have anything to say about this, Miss Reynolds? Lawyer Bev slowly stood up and spoke. Your Honor, the fact that my client may have her own funds does not relieve Mr. Reynolds of the responsibility to give her her share. Well, advisor, I don't like it when people lie to me. Ms. Reynolds claimed she was a beggar, which I learned was bullshit when she walked in here with a dear guy like you in tow. We now see that she was sufficiently financed by money that should have been public property, and she tried to deceive both her husband and the court on this matter. Since Mr. Reynolds pays the bills from his own funds, I see no reason to change any financial arrangements at this time. Once the divorce agreement is finalized, the property will be declared and divided accordingly. Case is closed. 
Bev caught me in the hallway as I was leaving. I started taking notes as she spoke. I'll get you, bastard. I'm going to tear you to pieces. Bev, you shouldn't be within 500 feet of me. I'll call the police if you don't move. By the way, how did you like prison? Are you ready to spend a lot more time there? You have been charged with a criminal offense. I could tell she wanted to swing at me, but I just kept moving down the hallway towards the door, and she stood there, fist clenched, face contorted, and red. That evening I went to a local bar. Not my usual hangout, but it was where I met an interesting guy a month earlier. The reason this guy was interesting was because he had a crap car. Luckily, Zeke was there, on his usual bar stool. Hey man, I remember you. What's your name again? It doesn't matter, Zeke. Hey, do you still have that shitty car? Oh God, yes, I hate this thing. The wife took a good one when she ran away with that bastard in a suit. The air conditioner in the car is broken and I'm dying in this heat. I don't have money for a new car and this is the only way I can get around. She took all the money and I have bad credit. Do you have paid car insurance? If you do what I tell you, I might be able to help you buy something better. I've got all your attention, bro. Let's say you're driving down, say, 38th Street, and a gray cat suddenly runs out in front of you. Naturally, you hit the brakes, and maybe the lady following you will crash too close into the back of your shitty car. At speeds over 15 miles per hour, your car will be completely destroyed. As long as your head is pressed against the headrest and you're wearing a seatbelt, you'll be fine. Insurance will cover your losses, and you could at least buy a car with air conditioning. Yes, but what if the lady who hit me gets hurt? I can't do this to a poor woman. Well, I can guarantee you that this lady will be a cheating slut wife, and there will be no one else in the car if you follow my instructions. What would you say to that? Oh man, that would be great. I hate cheating bitches, and I definitely need to get rid of this car. Park at the corner of 38th and Lessing by 5 p.m. tomorrow. Look to your left, and when you see the blue Miata leaving the parking lot and heading your way, you can pull out in front of it. She doesn't like to pass other cars, so drive a block or so until she's on your tail. Then you'll sort of see a cat running across the road, so get ready and hit the brakes hard. Just stay in the car afterwards. Dial 911 and tell the ambulance guys you think you might have a neck injury. And by the way, I've never met you. I will never be in this bar again. And we don't know each other. Dude, I'm a grave. Not as cold as the air conditioner in your new car. On Friday, I left work early to meet my daughter at home. She finished her classes and came home as we agreed on Sunday evening. We talked a little about the divorce situation, and I played her a recording of my conversation with her mother about door number three. Patty was shocked to hear her mother's ruthless tone and demands. I then played Patty a selection of recordings I had made over the previous two years, and she heard a side of Bev she never knew existed. What do you know about this guy she's with, Dad? I know that he is a very bad person, and I want you to stay away from him. If you need to meet your mom, make sure you are in a public place where there are people. I don't know what he can do to you to try to get to me. In any case, always have something to protect yourself if there is even the slightest chance that he might be around. Dad, I knew you and Mom had some problems, but I never realized how bad it was. What the hell happened to you guys? This was a question I was prepared for, and I launched into a long monologue explaining my view of things. Here's a slightly shorter version. Patty, as I now understand, your mother and I had completely different ideas about how marriage should work. I've thought about this a lot, and I have a theory. Someone has probably already thought about what I'm about to explain to you and written it all down in a book, but this idea came to me on my own. There are four main ways to distribute power in a relationship. There are times when neither party takes control, in which case everything just drifts like a rudderless ship. It may also happen that both partners take responsibility. In this case, perhaps they are constantly fighting over who is in charge, or maybe they are dividing things up so that each person controls some aspect of the relationship. They may even be able to share the responsibility equally. That's how I went into the relationship, expecting it to be this way. Things didn't turn out that way at all. Another way this can happen is when the man is in charge. 
This method may work under certain conditions. I know these days we think of paternalistic relationships as abusive and demeaning to women, but if a man is completely devoted to his wife, it can be like Snow White and Prince Charming. It can be a fabulous life for a wife with the right temperament. She will live without worrying about making difficult decisions, confident that her man will always take care of her. Or it may be similar to your maternal grandparents. Do you know that your grandmother was always as meek as a mouse and your grandfather was domineering and sometimes cruel? This is what your mother saw growing up, and I think now this is what she expected in our relationship. So when I tried to share first place with her, she started to think I was weak. The more I pleased her, the more she disrespected me. This brings me to the last possibility, a wife-dominant relationship. I guess your mom decided to be the boss when I couldn't live up to her image of a good person. She began to treat me cruelly. She decided which projects would be completed, and it was best that they were completed to her satisfaction. I can't tell you how many times she started some family business and then stood there and dictated exactly how I should do it. That's about the same number of things that were never completed because I couldn't stand being made to feel violated by my husband in my own home. She literally told me how I needed to hold a hammer or a screwdriver when I was building or fixing something. It was completely unbearable. You see, when a wife is dominant, in most cases there is something that goes against human nature. I don't understand how this type of relationship can work. A husband may be dominant and maintain love and affection for his wife, but the wife loses respect for any man she dominates. I think this is exactly what is happening to us. When I started to understand how things were and started to resist, Beverly didn't think I was taking responsibility. By then, she already thought I was a weakling, and when I refused to let her boss me around, she simply saw me as a rebellious child. I will never be able to regain her respect. I think this divorce case is my last chance to win her respect, so you will understand my actions when you see how hard it is for me to prove to her that I am intolerant of this lifestyle. Patty, you will soon find someone to be your life partner. When you're deciding things like having children, who to work for and where to live, think about how you're going to make decisions. Make sure you and your date know what to expect and be sure that there will be mutual respect between you. Otherwise, you will both be unhappy and may well end up in the situation that Bev and I found ourselves in. I will do so, Dad. I promise. A little later, the phone rang. Mr. Reynolds, this is Memorial Hospital. Your wife was in a car accident. She's stable and not too badly injured, but she'll be with us at least for the night. Patty and I drove to the hospital and I let her enter the room first. Patty didn't stay long and I asked if I could speak to Bev alone when she came out looking gloomy. I suspected Patty had harsh words for her. God, you look like crap, Bev, I said with a slight grin. What a shitty week for you, huh? First, you lose your marriage, husband, and home. You are then served with a restraining order and then arrested for a felony. Then you lose some of the money you were counting on. Now your car is totaled and you're lying in the hospital with a broken wrist and a crushed face from the airbag. I think this divorce is working out much better for me. Fuck you, she replied. Yes, Bev. Where's old Sly? Has he come to visit yet? Don't worry. He's probably having sex with one of his other two women right now. She turned pale. You probably didn't know about the others when you started all this, did you? Looks like you know now. I wonder how long it will be before he wants you to serve one of them. I never thought of you as a woman pleaser, but that's probably a good skill to learn considering how much you'll need it in prison. I'm not going to jail. My lawyer will get these false charges dropped. Really? You kind of crashed my car and threatened my health. Because when I talked to the DA, he made it clear that he was going to throw you in there. He has photographic evidence and he has an election coming up. Now he wants to look really badass while fighting crime. I think he will ask for the maximum. She just sat and looked at me. By the way, which car insurance company did you decide to contact? I asked. Car insurance? What do you mean? We still have the same old... You mean you didn't buy any insurance this week? When you filed for divorce, I took your car off my insurance. Of course you know about this. I mean, you demanded that your Miata only have your name on it, so it's your responsibility now. Honey, if you didn't get your insurance this week, you're really screwed. You'll have to pay a couple of fines, towing costs, and three years of payments. 
you might not be able to afford it and that Miata will sit in the back corner of some junkyard forever while you're still paying for it. But you may not need another car since you won't have a job after you're convicted of a felony. Plus, the guy you hit may have medical bills and his insurance company will want you to pay for the damages. Damn it. But at least you have your own medical care, right? I'm on yours. No, no. I dropped you from my health insurance on Monday. Didn't you change that too? Baby, you're screwed. The ambulance ride, the emergency room visit, the x-rays, the doctors, the cast on your right arm, the hospital stay, the aftercare. It will cost thousands and thousands of dollars. Hey, speaking of medicine, the other day I was thinking about the time you got sick a couple of years ago. Do you remember? I took a week off to take care of you. I held your head while you vomited, and I cleaned everything up when you didn't make it to the bathroom in time. I called the doctor and went to the pharmacy to buy you medicine. When you felt better a week later, you again began to scold me, insult me, and call me different names. I wonder how well old Sly will take care of you the next time you're sick. Well, it's time for me to go. Call Sly when you think he's done with his other slut. I wish you a good life. Beverly just sat and cried as I left. I did not care. After that, for some time, everything went as usual. Nothing special happened. I contacted Lindsay from time to time. She began to worry about Sly's power over Bev, and over time, Lindsay became distant from her. Then one evening, as I returned home and was heading to my front door, I was attacked on the lawn. I was quite cautious about possible attacks, but I didn't see it coming. The guy in the ski mask knocked the wind out of me, and twisted my arm behind my back. He screamed in my ear that I should give him the box of money and tell the DA to drop the charges. I was discouraged and could not defend myself. However, I still had the car alarm remote in my hand, so I pressed the panic button and it went off. Sly got angry and hit me again. He then jumped up and quickly ran away as the neighbor's porch lights came on and people started looking out. I yelled for them to call 911 and a few minutes later, a police officer showed up. I wasn't hurt enough for an ambulance ride, and Sly was long gone. None of my neighbors said they could identify him, so he got away with the attack. An even bigger shock came when I called my daughter and told her about it the next day. Dad, I didn't want to tell you, but I also had a run-in with Sly. Mom called me to talk. I told her that we could talk, but away from his apartment. She asked me to pick her up, but when I arrived, she sat me down on their couch. Then Sly came out and spoke to me. He said that since Mom wasn't coping well with her injuries in bed, I would have to take care of his needs myself. He said that she owed him and that I would pay for it. I looked at my mother, and she just looked at the floor and didn't say anything. Sly said, tell her to do it. Mom looked at me and said, please, baby, stay with him. It won't be that bad and I really need you to do this for me. He then walked towards me and grabbed my wrist to force me to stand up. He said we were going to the bedroom. My right hand was on the pepper spray in my purse, and when he pulled me away, I sprayed it in his face. He screamed and grabbed his face, and I grabbed my purse and tried to pull my mother out the door, but she pulled away and walked towards him. I yelled at her to come with me, but she was helping him in the bathroom, so I left. I can't believe my own mom tried to set me up with that bastard. I don't know if I can ever forgive her for this. I was seething, like any father in my position. I thought about my Beretta in the bedroom and almost went after it. After some time, my daughter reassured me, saying that she was not hurt, and advised me to think about the future. I made Patty promise not to walk alone until after the trial, and to always have protection with me. She said that she would only date other students, and would never be alone in public, so I gradually pulled myself together. Sly told me to talk to the DA, but he didn't expect me to have the conversation that I actually had. I played a recording of my daughter talking about Sly, and reminded him that Sly attacked me. The DA asked if I would be willing to go easy on Bev or maybe drop the charges. Absolutely not! I want you to ask for the maximum! Bev is under the control of this snake, and the only way I can see to help her is to get her away from him. A few months in prison might get her straightened out. The district attorney agreed, and the trial continued. 
I felt pretty confident at home and at work, but there were times when I was vulnerable. When I drove into or out of the garage, I was open to attack. But I was very careful on the way to and from work. Our house is located in an area about 10 miles down the ranch road. For 15 miles, this is the only turnoff of this road. The only thing else there is a row of large ranches with locked gates. So, I was very aware of other problem areas on this long drive home. I always carried a Beretta with me. One evening, a few days before Bev's trial was set to begin, I saw the headlights of a pickup truck behind me, about two miles down the road from home, and it gave me goosebumps. Soon he was 20 feet from my rear bumper, going 55 and peach. I dialed 911 on my phone and pressed the record button on my little voice recorder. When I increased the speed to 70, the pickup stayed with me. I made a quick comment to the 911 operator, asking her to call the detective who was investigating my beating. The truck maintained pressure for another five miles while I frantically told the operator what was happening. The pistol was lying on the seat next to me, and I took it off the safety. I realized that there was a bridge ahead spanning a small creek bed with old-fashioned concrete railings. I guessed that Sly, or whoever was driving the truck, would make his move to run me off the road at this point. A hundred yards before the bridge, the pickup accelerated, and I knew it would try to run me off the road. I caught a glimpse of Bev's face in the passenger seat of the pickup as it pulled alongside me. I hit the brakes hard enough to send the car into a skid, but not so hard that I lost control. The truck stopped in front of me, but it missed my front bumper due to my braking. My car skidded along the side of the road and stopped. Her back ended up on a slope leading down to the creek bed. I climbed out, grabbed my gun, phone, and recorder, and headed down the steep gravel slope under the bridge. As I headed down, I saw the pickup's brake lights come on. I stumbled in the dark, feeling my way under the bridge. This was a great way to encounter a rattlesnake resting on the warm ground. But this was not the snake I was worried about at the time. I was breathing heavily and trying to find the safest place to hide. Finally, I stopped and cocked the Beretta. I waited but didn't hear anything for a while. Cell phone contact with 911 was lost. I tried to redial the number in the dark, but being under the bridge was not the best place to get a signal. I was stuck and had no idea if help was on the way. At least I didn't hear the pickup truck overhead growling. I had no intention of moving. I told myself I would spend the night there if I had to. It seemed to take forever, but it was probably only five or ten minutes before I heard a siren in the distance, coming from the same direction as me. If they were so far behind, they would never catch up to the pickup truck. The police car apparently stopped when they saw my car on the side of the road, and I began to walk up the hill, leaving the Beretta under the bridge. I raised my hands and asked them not to shoot. As I approached the road, I saw that there were two cars, and they were parked across the road, blocking both lanes of traffic. Around the same time, I heard sirens coming from the other side and saw a pickup truck heading back to the bridge. I fell into the mud. I couldn't see much from the ground, but I heard the pickup screech to a stop, and the officers yelled for the driver to get out and get on the ground. Other police cars following the pickup stopped behind it. Soon it was all over. Bev and Snakey Sly were in custody on attempted murder charges. I was very worried, but I went home, took a shower, and tried in vain to sleep. When your spouse is accused of multiple felonies, divorce seems to be very easy. I received a lot of sympathy from the judge and no resistance from Bev or her harried lawyer. Bev desperately wanted to spend as little time in prison as possible. She offered, through her lawyer, to give me virtually everything in the divorce for any help I could provide in mitigating her sentence. During the sentencing hearing, I testified that she was a good wife and mother until she fell under Sly's influence. I told the judge that in time I could forgive her for trying to kill me. I forgot to mention that she almost certainly cheated on me with other men and made my life hell for years. I could not read her facial expression in the courtroom, and I never spoke to her directly during this time. In the end, Sly went to prison for a long time. This was not his first crime. I really hope he's sharing a cell with a big sweaty man named Bubba, who thinks his ass is cute as candy.
The judge was kinder to Bev, but it will be at least three years before she is up for parole. So, it's been about four years since Bev was locked up. I heard from the DA's office that she was paroled about a year ago. I kept waiting to hear from her. I know she's not in touch with Patty. Revenge is great and all, but not as great as expected. I found myself unable to stop thinking about everything that had happened, so I did something I didn't expect. I called my ex-wife. Bev, this is Jack. I have something of yours and I want it back. I called the rehab center, where Bev now lived. For several seconds, I didn't know if she heard me. There was no answer. Beverly, I want to give you a shoebox. Can you hear me? Can we meet somewhere so I can get her back? I thought she would hang up, but finally she spoke. Where? When? I don't care. We can meet somewhere neutral, like a restaurant, or you can come to my house. Anything you want. Maybe on Sunday. Are you free on Sunday? She was silent for a little longer. I'll be there on Sunday at two o'clock. The phone went off. How do you prepare to face your ex-wife, the mother of your child, the woman who tried to kill you, and a convicted felon? I made lemonade and cookies. I opened the door for Bev, and neither of us even tried to shake hands, let alone hug. We simply said hello, and I motioned for her to come into the office. Her hair was much shorter than before, and her eyes were stern. She wasn't wearing much, if any, makeup. Now she was 50 years old and looked 65. There were drinks, cookies, and a shoebox on the coffee table. She sat down opposite the sofa, and I offered her soft drinks, which she refused. Did she really suspect that I would try to poison her? Well, if you don't want lemonade and cookies, I think the only thing you need is a shoebox and whatever we could say to each other. What's the catch, Jack? What do you want instead? Is there anything left in it? She was still very suspicious of me. There's no trick, Bev. It's all there except for a few thousand that I put in with an equal amount of my own money and gave to Patty when she got married as a down payment on her house. If you want, she will happily begin to return this money to you at any time convenient for you. I simply gave her my share of the money. I could tell from Bev's face that she didn't know Patty was married. Patty has been married for two years, and you are already a grandmother. I saw the tension in her eyes and knew she was struggling with her emotions. The little girl's name is Shannon Beverly Evans. Shannon is the name of her other grandmother. Bev's eyes filled with tears, despite her best efforts. Bev, I know you haven't talked to Patty for a while. There must be a way for you to connect again. If you want, I can pave the way for you. Beverly nodded, tears now streaming down her cheeks. I reached over to the side table for the box of tissues I had placed on the coffee table. So I'll tell you the short version of what happened to us, if you don't want to leave right now. She wiped tears from her cheek and tried to pull herself together. Patty found a great guy. His name is Stan Evans. He understands computers and computer networks. They seem to get along really well together. She is a wonderful mom, and they are so devoted to each other. Martha and I only lasted a few months. She's too young for me, and she just needed me temporarily until she could get her life back on track. She found another guy and left. I date some, but I end the relationship if there seems to be an emotional attachment going on. I'm better off alone. I will remain single. There was silence for some time. Now I am going to say some things that are purely for my benefit, but you can also get something useful from them. I hope you do. I couldn't wait to see you in prison. I hated you and imagined you dead many times. And then when they locked you up, my feelings started to change. I found that I couldn't enjoy my victory when it was all over, so I stopped hating you. Even though you didn't ask me to do it, I forgave you. The reason is because I know that you are not 100% at fault. I couldn't understand you until it was too late and we stopped communicating with each other. We were just quarreling. Beverly pulled herself together and looked up from the floor. She gave me a lost look, but didn't say anything. This is true. Briefly and clearly. If you have nothing to tell me, and if you don't want to get something to eat, I won't keep you any longer. You probably have important things to do. She stood up and took the box. 
As she headed toward the front door for the first time since I pushed her out all those years ago, I called out to her. Beverly, it doesn't matter now, and you don't have to answer if you don't want to. But I'm interested. The whole time we were together, and especially on that last day you were here, it was obvious that you thought I was a weakling. Do you still think I'm a wimp, Bev? She stopped with her hand on the doorknob and looked back at me. I hate you. You are cruel and you have ruined my life. She paused. But I don't think you're a weakling. And then she disappeared from my life forever. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.